I am so glad to be with you. It sounds strange to say since this is an online connection, but I have missed being with you. I'm grateful for each of you and excited about what we're going to do together. This is the beginning of a new year, and very often for a lot of us, the start of a new year causes us to think about our lives and in what ways would I like to be new? How would I like to be different? How would I like to be better? But often we get overwhelmed or discouraged by this. Roy Baumeister, who's maybe the preeminent social psychologist in our day, says that when therapists work with folks, very often people can, with little effort, come up with at least 15 different goals that they're pursuing. But of course, these goals will often conflict with each other and we'll often have this happen at the start of a year. I want to do better at my work, but I want to spend more time with my family and I want to be in better shape physically and exercise more. And all of these things takes time, so they actually get in the way of each other. And then we get overwhelmed and we get discouraged and we often just give up. I'll just stay the same way that I am. Baumeister writes about an expert meeting with a group of elite generals at one point and talking about the challenge of trying to plan and manage your life and manage your time and how do you go about doing that? How would you express that in 25 words or less? Interestingly, not a single one of them can do it except for one general who, as it happens, was the only woman in the room. And here's how she approached that kind of planning, goal setting, looking to the future. She said, I will write down all of my priorities in order of their importance, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. Write them all down, every one of them. And then I will cross out everything from three on down. In other words, really, all I can live with is two of them. Now, interestingly, her approach was quite similar to that of a man by the name of Jesus, who was approached one time, what, is, what really matters? What should I pursue in life? What makes a life worth living? And he said, just two things. Cross out all the other priorities, just these two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And then the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There are two, love God, love people, but they're inextricably connected because love Uh, To will the good for the other and to want to be with the other is just a basic orientation of the self. And so uh, the New Testament writers say quite a lot about this. If I think that I'm loving God when I'm not actually loving the people around me, then I am deceiving myself. So that's what matters. The person that I become, the person that you become, mostly to be pervaded with love. And we all know this. When somebody dies, what we relish talking about with them, if we're able to, is the way that they just love and cared for people from one moment to the next. Nobody who lives a life pervaded by love lives a bad life, no matter what they don't accomplish. And nobody who does not love, no matter how impressive their life, lives a good life. And so Jesus was precisely right about this. And I want to be that kind of person. That's what matters above all. It's easy to forget that. It's easy to be overwhelmed by it. It's easy to be discouraged by my lack of progress. So, 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 we're going to proceed together because we can't do this on our own. But he can. And we can surrender. We can let him. And we're going to do that by uh, having as our companion over these days a man named Dallas Willard and the book of his Renovation of the Heart. It's very striking when Jesus says, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. It turns out that these dimensions are precisely the core aspects of being a person. And Dallas writes about that in the book, Renovation of the Heart, with a clarity and a simplicity that I have never found any place else. It's an integration of what psychology attempts to study and spiritual life and thoughtful faith that is unbelievably helpful. 
Those are also the parts of us that need to be redeemed, that need to be transformed from the inside out if we are to become different people. So we're going to go on that journey together. I want to start with this invitation that's on the first page of the book. Dallas writes, When we open ourselves to the writings of the New Testament, when we absorb our minds and hearts in one of the Gospels, for instance, the overwhelming impression that comes upon us is we are looking into another world and another life. It is a divine world and a divine life. It is life in the kingdom of the heavens. Yet it is a world and a life that ordinary people have entered and are entering even now. It is a world that seems open to us and beckons to us. We feel its call. We feel its call. And I want to tell you uh, part of why I'm so excited about this journey and want Dallas to be a companion on it with us is that there's a way that I felt the call, the beckoning of this other world, of this other reality through him in a unique way. Now, he'd be the first to say that's not at all about him. And that can happen with anybody when they discover Jesus. But I found as I began to read his words and that I can still remember it's been more than 30 years ago. The first night I went to their old house in Box Canyon and sat there and talked to this man and it was like there was nothing else in the world that he had to do. It was the strangest thing. The telephone would ring. Back in those days, there were no cell phones. There was no voicemail. There was nothing more urgent than a phone ringing. And anybody would answer the phone. People actually answered the phone back in those days. And he just let it ring. Because it was like there was nothing more important than to be with another person, whoever that person was. Because God would be in that moment. God would be in that conversation. And I realized when I sat there with this man, as brilliant as his mind was, his heart was even better, and that God was apparently present to him in a way that I had just not experienced with other people. Maybe it had been there as or more deeply with other people, but I'd never seen it in that way. And it was like, uh, he is living in a reality that I want to live in. Not because I'm supposed to, but because there's this freedom in it. And here's the invitation, this again, just from the first page of this book, Renovation of the Heart. This is Jesus. Those who drink of the water that I will give them will never again be thirsty. The water I give will be in them a spring of water gushing up into eternal life. And Dallas writes about this. Jesus' own words promises that he will give us from being ever thirsty again, being driven and ruled by unsatisfied desires. Now, this is one of many ways that Dallas is really helpful. Just that word thirsty. We'll tend to read words like that and just blip over them and not live with them. But not Dallas. He just hundreds and hundreds of words he would reflect on and think about. Everything that's been written about that word from Homer on and penetrate. What does it mean? To thirst means to be ruled or driven by unsatisfied desire. And now with Jesus, a life beyond thirst is made available to us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not live a life that's ruled or driven by unsatisfied desires, but I gotta have this. I must have this money, I must have this experience, I must have this success, I must have people think about me. If you're thirsty, so if you're wondering, who gets to go on this journey? Is that only the believer, it is only the mature, is that only the no 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 you just got to be thirsty you just got to whine about something you just got to complain about something you just got to not be satisfied with something and then the promise is over time from the core of your being this is not about following rules this is not about behavioral modification I have a little young person that I love who sometimes FaceTimes to make coffee with me. And after that coffee is made, because it's made by this little person, the climax of our liturgy is I will taste it and go, ah, and then say, I must womp my belly. And he will say, not everybody needs to see that. And I will say, no, but this is so good. I must womp my belly and I will raise my shirt in FaceTime and he will raise his and we will womp our bellies. We will be belly wompers because for a moment there is so much goodness and delight and gratitude and joy. And Jesus says, now I'm, I'm making available a kind of life to you that in an unforced way from the core of your being out of your belly, will flow rivers of living water. Now, you may be somebody who has 
uh, tried to live a life of faith for a long time and you look at a statement like that and it's kind of overwhelming or discouraging and you feel like, man, I don't feel like that. Well, it comes to those of us who live in the desert, who are thirsty. And the desert thirst is a painful thing. I was talking last week with a few people I love and somebody asked the question, what does it mean to you to be a healthy family? And that question was so painful for me. I had been watching an old television show called The Waltons. It was set back in the Depression. Some of you might remember it. It was maybe just a tiny bit romanticized. But I thought about watching that when I was 18 years old and the expectations that I had for life and for family and then just thinking, how did I get here? How is it that I am where I am in the pain that I feel? And yet, and yet, and yet, there is so much goodness. People that I love have walked together with me in life at such a depth. The opportunity to be with people, including so many of you, in the deep places of the desert and thirsting and pain is such a precious gift. I feel those waters. Not gushing yet. It's not belly whomping time all the time, but I feel it. And that's the invitation. Dallas writes, as we walk through this process, it will enable us to walk increasingly in wholeness, holiness, and power. No one need live in spiritual and personal defeat. Now, of course, the alternative to that is that some or most or all must. No one need live in spiritual or personal defeat. So that's the invitation. If you're thirsty today, when you take a drink, remember your thirst. Remember the invitation. We'll go on this journey together. See you next time. So when you're faced with a challenge to love, that is, to seek what is good in a particular situation and not respond just to your fears or even your hopes or whatever, then you make room for God.